It is so good to welcome you all here today on this special, special day for mothers. Um, my name is Carmen. My husband, Aaron, and I have the privilege of leading here at Trillith. As he said, it's south of the border. But uh, just so you know a little bit about Trillith, like it's across the street. It's kind of near in between Fayetteville and Peachtree City. Like if you're driving to the airport, we're like three or four exits beyond that on 85 South. So but across the street from us is one of the world's largest movie producing film studios. And we're soon to be, when all the studios get built, the largest in America. So God is doing some amazing things here in this community and gathering some people together here. And we're so, so, it's been, I've been a part of church planning for a long time, my husband and I, and it is the most wind in my sails spirit-led church plant I have ever had the privilege of being a part of. Um, the people here are amazing. Uh, they've been planting seeds and prayers for this, uh, to see this in their community for decades. And so it's an honor and a privilege to le be here. We snuck down here from Midtown, Atlanta, uh, in 2020, and we were like, don't tell anybody we're going to the suburbs because our hearts were so city-leaning, um, but uh, we did and found the most amazing people and community, and we so love it here um, and have planted roots here. And so our kids are thriving, and it's such a blessing. And then like three months after we moved here, we ran into, or my husband ran into Louie and Brad at you know, lunch, and he was like, what are you doing here? <laughs> so that's how that came about. And um, we just, we love it so much. Um, but it is a special, special day. Uh, Mother's Day, maybe you don't know the history of it. I love history, so I had to do a little Google search. A lady named Anna Jarvis in, I want to say, I wrote it down, 1908, uh, wanted to honor her deceased mother and all the sacrifices she had made for her. So she um, went to church and asked her pastor, and they had a service celebrating moms, and her mom in particular. And she thought a lot of the national holidays and things were very male-oriented, so she started a letter-writing campaign. And in a few short years, churches all across America had started observing Mother's Day the second Sunday in May. And then just a few short years, so from 1908 till 1914, Woodrow Wilson made it a national holiday. And so she did amazing work in that little time to make it a national holiday. So we celebrate moms today and all forms of moms, and it's an honor and a privilege to be able to share here today from this stage. Um, but I do want to ask my very good friend, Kirsten Watson. Y'all help me welcome Kirsten. She is an incredible woman, um, most of all a daughter of God and a child of God and my sister in Christ. And We've become good friends because we live south of the border and uh, mutual friends. And um, I've watched her life. God has given them an incredible influence and platform. She and her husband, Ben, who shared with our house a few months ago, um, were those nomadic NFL family. You know, when we get traded or, you know, move from city to city, and in that time had seven children. So I know you can see the crown on top of her head. It is radiant, <laughs> but she does it with grace and beauty, and I follow her um, also, and you can too. They do a podcast called Why or Why Not with the Watsons. It's amazing. Got some great nuggets of wisdom in there, and uh, I, her book, which I think is one of the best titles ever. You can, they were supposed to put it on my side, but hold it. You be Vanna. Um, sis, take a breath. <laughs> I love that book. You can get it on Amazon. I highly recommend it. And she's um, the editor of Mom Life Today. So Kirsten, please introduce us to you and your family. Yes, thank you so much. It is really an honor to be here. I thank all the passion people that uh, made it happen because I was going to say no because there's a lot of you out here. Um, but God said, no, you have to go. And so I'm honored to be here. And um, as Carmen said, um, I'm married to Benjamin. He spoke here a couple months ago. He's right over there with our twins. And uh, my mom is here, so I'm super grateful for that as well. And yes, we spent 16 seasons in the NFL, did a lot of moving, and along the way, we picked up seven little people. Um, 
that are with us. So it's great to, it. to be here. I love it. And I did learn on the podcast, um, to pick on Ben for a second, one Mother's Day. Mother's Days can be hard. Sometimes there's unmet expectations. Just throwing that out there. And uh, one Mother's Day, they get the kids ready, go to church, come home. She's like, what's next? And he says, we need to eat. And she says, I'll start cooking. <laughs> but you have plans to date, right? Ben, please say yes. Yes. Yes, he has plans. That if was a one-time. If you do not time. have plans to yes. feed your family today, guys, make plans right Did now. Get it together. Yeah. I'll let you look down at your phone for a second to get the kids, afternoon settled. Kids, yeah. make those plans for your dad or... Yeah. Whatever needs to happen. The moms don't want to make any decisions today. None. None. I don't want to, yes, take care of everything. So, good job. I know you got this. Y'all are an amazing family. And anybody who spends time with you guys, especially with you and your kids, are just walk away in awe at the respect of your children and the family discipleship that goes on in your home. Tell us a little bit about how your philosophy and how you do seven kids and lead them to love the Lord. Y'all, this is trial and error. Um, I wish I could give you, like, this is actually going to work, but we had the twins. Actually, before the twins, first let me tell you this. We have four twins that are four, and then we have a 14-year-old. We just realized next year we will literally have pre-Kers, elementary school students, middle school students, and someone in high school. So we have the whole span of the people from 14, 13, 12, 11, 7. But no more diapers? No, but I'll tell you, that video that we time. watched, I was like, we could do another one? <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Um, yeah, um, but yeah, I think one thing I think I've, um, the more I'm in the Word and, and Benjamin and I study, uh, the Bible talks about uh, children being an inheritance from the Lord. It talks about specifically that they're being arrows in the hand of a, of a warrior. And so the way we approach that um, with having, so uh, having seven children, um, is that I don't want to have a dull arrow. And it's not up to me, but it is up to me and it's up to us to point our people to Jesus. And so that is kind of leads our way in, in what we think, and some of it's our bent, right? It's my, my personality to be a certain way, but ultimately we're thinking about shooting these arrows out into places that we will never go. Um, and I don't want them to be dull and I want them to know, um, I want them to know the Lord. That's so good. That's so good. So we want to cast, honestly, your heart, and sharing today is a very wide net. I want you to talk a minute about who we're honoring today. Like, there are so many dynamics in different seasons of life, like Aaron mentioned, of infertility and wanting to be a mom, or even a teenager who's not a mom yet, but has younger siblings, and they're their little mama, like they help take care of them. Or even up to, you know, you're married and now you're balancing and juggling, celebrating you as a mom and your mom as a mom and your mother-in-law as a mom. And it can be a little tricky sometimes. And then there's some people who never chose never to have kids or some people who had abortions or, you know, like it's a heavy, hard day for some people. So speak today about who we're honoring today. Yeah, I think... Um... I'm in a both and, if I can be honest with you today, because it was awesome that my kids came and, and sang to me this morning. It was, it was lovely. Um, but, there's a nut, but there's another part of me that is also very sad. We have two kids that I never got to meet um, through miscarriage. And so I know this day holds a lot of weight. It's very layered for many. Um, you've spoken about that um, just now. But I think there's women coming in that... Um, have miscarried, have lost child to maybe even adoption. Things are great up to a point, and then something changes. Um, you mentioned um, losing children to abortion, to all the things that we are dealing with as women. I think sometimes as humans, we want to, you know, honor the one that you can see the people. Um, but I think it's important for us um, to do our best, but to understand ultimately that God sees you. Yeah. God sees you. He knows you. Um, and he knows your story, and he doesn't waste anything that you've experienced. Um, and the only way to, we can do our best in honoring, but the only thing I can tell you is that you have a God who sees you, and he's looking for you to look to him. And I think that's a little bit of what we're going to talk about today. Okay. Yeah. Um, today, we're, we want to dive into flourishing in all kinds of seasons. I look across this room, and I see moms I admire, and, you know, but sometimes we, as moms, look to the past and we're like, 
oh, I remember when they were babies and I just want to go back there for a second. Or when they were here, I'm an empty nester and they were just here. You know, I don't care what season, I just want them to be here. Or, you know, in the future, like how do we flourish in and out of all these different seasons of mothering, keeping our eyes on Jesus and not the past or the future, but on Jesus? That's hard. (laughs) It's always hard. Um, But I do think in Matthew 14, uh, starting in verse 22, it talks about um, Jesus walking on the water. And I think that'll set us up. Uh, really nicely to talk about how do we flourish in the season that we're in. It says, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he sent the crowds away. After he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him, On the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened. And began to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him and said to him, you of little faith, why do you doubt? When they got in the boat, the wind stopped, and those who were in the boat worshiped him, saying, you are certainly God's son. And the reason why I think that helps us to figure out how to flourish in the season that we're in is because we have to pay attention to what we're looking at. More importantly, we need to pay attention to who we're looking at. And if we are not conscious about that, we will be led to look at the waves. And the waves cause us to sink. What's funny is uh, early this year, um, Benjamin was in the car with one of our sons, um, and he came home. He said, yeah, Judah said he saw something while we were driving, but it was not it at all. I think he may not be able to see. And I was like... Sure. You know, like as a, as a mom, you, you have these categories like this needs to be taken care of or this is probably not a situation I need to deal with right now. It's not that important. Well, Judah seeing something incorrectly went into the other category for me at that moment. A couple months later, I got a call. The teacher or well, the teacher emailed me. She says, hey, we moved him to the different seat. He said he can't see. So now I moved him up and now everything's OK. So that now all of a sudden that file of don't worry about it moved over to like, I need to do something. So I scheduled him an appointment. We go and he can't see. He cannot see. And the doctor looks at me and she's like, mama. Um, He cannot see a thing. And I'm like, I thought he would tell me. I mean, if you can't see, surely. I mean, he reads all the time, y'all. I'm thinking if he can't see, he would tell me. Well, he didn't. And she says, well, sometimes we don't have the vocabulary to express what we can't see because it becomes normal to us. So we can't distinguish the fact that it's something bad. And I said, oh, okay, that'll preach. Let me put that back there. And then we go and we put, we go get the glasses. Y'all, I wish I would have videotaped his first response. Made me happy and want to cry at the same time because he's like, mommy, I can read that and I can read that. We're driving home. He goes, I had no idea trees had individual trunks. I'm like, the leaves are so beautiful. And he's saying all these things and the other kids are like, we get it, Judah, you can see, calm down. But it it reminded me like how many times in our lives are we going through life and we don't notice that the trees have trunks because we've gone the same way. We have this idea of what it's supposed to look like, but I believe that God through his word does a little one, two, one, two. And when we go and we read through the spirit, with the Spirit enabling us to see things, it changes our perspective. And it changes how we look at our situations. And so so we're not looking to the past. We're not looking to to the future. Because wherever we are, we say, God, you have put me here. Give me eyes to see what I am supposed to see right now. And let me walk in that in obedience. Yes, that's so good. I remember that. As a second grader myself, I got glasses and I was like, trees have like individual, like I can see them. It's, 
And isn't that interesting in our spiritual life? Like we think we're fine. I mean, we, have, we may have some trials. We may have some pit moments, but it's fine. I'll pull myself up. It'll get better in the future. But if you don't have eyes to see what God is doing, sometimes he uses those circumstances and situations, obviously for his glory and our good, but to mold and shape our identity through perseverance and endurance and Like, talk about that for a second, about shaping your identity. I think your point about the waves, like if we take our eyes off Jesus and start looking at the waves or current circumstance or situation of your life, that starts to inform your identity. I'm a, like my daughter might say, I'm a diabetic. No, you're you're a person who has type 1 diabetes, but that doesn't identify who you are. So sometimes those waves that are beating and battering us, and we are looking at those we have to realize that those are the same waves that Jesus is walking on top of them. They're under his feet. Everything beating us up, he walks on top of that, right, church? He is more powerful, but it might might scare us to be like, he's bigger than cancer, because cancer's pretty scary. He's bigger than my kid being in jail, because that's pretty scary, and I can't fix it this time. He's bigger than those waves and those trials that batter us. And he's calling us to keep our eyes on him. But that invitation from Peter to walk out on the water, he wants us to walk on top of those things. Not just fix them and pray they go away. But like walk, get out on the water with him and walk on top of those things that scare us the most. Talk a little bit about identity and how moms might put their identity in their kids asking for a friend. Yeah, right. Um, (laughs) I hear you. And how we get our identity by keeping our eyes on him. Yeah, identity is is a lot. Um, Because I think the world or the the things around us want us want us to put our identity in something else. Right? So it's like, where do you work? Where do you live? Where do your kids go to school? How much money do you make? And these are the things that we identify ourselves by and unfortunately end up putting our identity in, and which is scary, because those hold no ground. They're not a firm foundation. They are the waves, right? If I put my identity in something that can be taken away, then all of a sudden I start viewing my life as something I have to control. I grip it harder. I, I'm, I'm not enjoying it because it could be taken it away. It could, it could be taken away. So I think when it comes to identity in anything other than Christ, it's all through here. It's not firm. And I think that's exactly what happens with Peter. As he's looking at the Lord, he is literally walking on the water. And something happens. And he looks and he becomes afraid. And so I think that, and all throughout Scripture, shows us that anything other than Jesus um, will, will, will cause you to sink. And so we have to make sure that those things are, I'm not saying those things, any of those things are bad. Yes, trials are terrible, but I'm not saying that where you live and um, where you go to school and, you know, how many, I'm not saying those are bad things, but those are not the life-giving thing. And we have to make the distinction between the two. I think in a lot of those things, the more life I live and um, I realize that those most painful things are kind of leaning or building a platform for a calling. They're kind of setting us up um, for the ministry that God wants to give you in a few years after you've matured and grown and seen uh, what, he can, what he has done through you. So community is so important in that, people calling that out in you. People like, you know, who you've said this to me, that are not enamored by me. They're enamored by what God is doing in and through me. And they're constantly even pointing me back to Jesus. So talk about community. I know there's comparison. There's all these things that the enemy wants to do to steal your joy, and the mom guilt. The enemies, he's not wise. He uses the same tricks and tools to get our eyes off of Jesus. And so talk to, uh, to us a minute about community and how, why that's so important. I will say as a testimony, there's nothing in my life that has helped free me more with you know Jesus, but the, I serve on the Grove leadership team, and those door holders cheer me on like no other female relationship I've ever had. Every birthday, they send flowers. Every opportunity I have to share or to offer my gifts in some way, they are the first text I get cheering me on. 
They're an incredible group of women. So if you are not serving and finding those people in your life, the community is so important to help form all of those things. Yeah, this, this is a good nugget for everyone. I think we live in a world where we're together, but we're not. You've heard this before. Um, you have, um, have got to find people who see you, like that know your junk and that um, they know how to pray for you. Too many times we put on a good face, we get dressed up, we come to a place where you're, for sick people, <laughs> and no one's sick. Everyone looks fine, right? I get out of the car, I'm, you know, telling my kids, let me tell you something. And I'm giving them, the, don't you go in there, go in there and act, you know. And then I get in, I'm like, yeah, everyone's so good, you know. Um, you got to find your people who, um, who you can be honest with, who you can be vulnerable with those people who are gonna point you back to Jesus. Like I said, they're not, they're not impressed by you. They're, they're in awe of what God is doing in your life. They see you when you are down because they, they, they're part of the journey with you. And I think too often we don't have those people. I call them like your dark alley friends, your no makeup friends. They don't, they don't care what your house looks like friends. Those people who can come to you and speak life into you because this life is not meant to be done alone. It's just not, and too many of us are. We go into the same spaces and the same places and no one knows us. And you may feel protected that way, but I tell you, when you release some of the stuff that you've had on your heart, when you release some of the things that you are struggling with, with people who are wise, people who want the best for you, the people that want to do life with you, there's a freedom, there's aroma about you to be like, girl, I don't have it all together. And that's okay. And, they see, and you see them, and they see you, and it's just amazing. So community is huge. Um, it's one of my biggest things. So I'm like, you gotta find your people. You gotta find your people. Because this is hard. This is hard. Yeah. I think uh, it's interesting in verse um, 33 of what you read. Uh, it said, it ends with, and those in the boat worshiped him. And it just makes me think, who's, who's in my boat? But you know, probably my kids. If you're a mama, your kids are in your boat and what God does in and through you, even if you get called out on the water and you walk for a split second on top of those waves and then you crash (laughs) and Jesus rescues you and you get back in the boat at the end of the day doing authentic life with people, those people in your sphere are gonna end up at the same point of worshiping Jesus. And so being authentic with people is tricky and it might cost you to be vulnerable. Um, I think the church probably needs to be called out on a few things that if someone has brought to you a confession of a shame, we wanna release the power of the enemy and there's no better way to do that than to like tell people what you're carrying, confess it. To Jesus, yes, but to someone else and it it starts slowly taking away the power that the enemy has over your silence, right? So speak it out. But when they do speak it out, church, don't condemn them. Welcome them in. Be their brother, their sister. Walk, do life together. And so, you know, we briefly mentioned abortion. And I feel like the church has shamed women and caused them to, yes, it's a horrible thing and a horrible um, choice that a woman made one time or in the past, in her past, but she still carries that. And it may be something that's holding her back, the shame of the enemy. And I wanna speak to a moment about calling and about how God wants to free us from the shame and help inform the calling he has on our life. Yeah, I mentioned this before, and that's so great, uh, Carmen, because I do think all of us come with some stuff, right? And it's, we almost think it's better if no one knows, because I'll just be different now. And I think that's the thing, main thing the enemy uses to keep us in bondage. Um, but as I said before, God doesn't waste anything. Right. Nothing. So that means whatever you've experienced, whatever you've done, we already know there's no condemnation for those that are in Jesus Christ. Yeah. And so because of that, if we, that's why we have to be in the scriptures. Because if we listen to our voices in our head or we listen to the world, they will say, do not do that. Or that's not your calling. But let me tell you something. <laughs> Quick story, I went to the SEC championship, 
hadn't been to college football in a minute. And I, there's a new thing that's happening. Well, it's probably old, but new for me. Um, there's someone on, there's two men on the side of the, the, the um, sideline and they hold out, that's like an accordion and it's like a big sheet and the coach stands in front of there to give the signals. And so I'm the whole time, instead of watching the game, sorry, just for a second, watching these people just literally open the accordion and close all up and down the sideline. They can't, half the time they can't even see the game. They're just holding it. And then the guy comes and they just go down the sideline. And I'm thinking, what if I was called to just do that? Because a lot of times we want to be the quarterback. Like Benjamin is a tight end. He's one of the most capable people that I know. He's one of the most hardest working people that I know. I'm sure he could play any position on the field. But when it was time for an extra point, the person I did not want to see was Benjamin Watson. Why? Not because I didn't trust him, but because it wasn't his job. And too many of us, when we talk about our calling and the things that have happened to us and how God has used us, we want to do someone else's job because that looks fun. Does it? You have no idea. And so if we stay in our lane, if we stay in what God has called us to, what we've experienced, and we use that to advance the kingdom, that'll be more powerful than you working outside of your calling. And so what I thought about with those guys, you know, we're holding the, the accordion, I'm looking through the brochure or the, the thing with all the names in it, I didn't see their names. But they were crucial to getting the play at the right time, at the right moment, to know, so the, the players know exactly what to look for. They were cute, they were crucial. But you know who, know who knew them? Their mamas and daddies. They were sitting somewhere in that stadium going, that's my boy, that's him. That, no, not on the field, right there, holding the court. That thing, he is so important to that coach. And that's what God does to us. Whatever we're doing, He's like, that's my girl, right? You see, right there? You, no, you don't, right, right there. And he's, he calls us out because he sees us. And I'm like, my encouragement to you is to do what God has told you to do and stop looking around trying to do other people's things because it does not benefit the kingdom. It does not benefit the body because what you have experienced and what you're choosing not to share is a hole that we cannot fill. So please, the calling is so important to step into that. The boat had to be scary. The wind, stepping out of that had to be scary. And the, you said, Peter didn't walk the whole way to Jesus. He, he started sinking and Jesus pulled him up. But guess what? The people in the boat still praised Jesus. Your calling is not about you anyway. It's about the kingdom. It's about how Jesus is gonna use what you have for the benefit of his people. So what, when you get that, and you get that through reading the scripture from it, you know, and being enlightened in what you're doing and what you're reading, and you say, God, I don't want to do that. He's like, no, but you're going to do that. No, God, I have these conversations. I'm like, no, but that's, that's just, I'm not going to speak at the church. No, but you are. <laughs> you are. And yes, the tuckle is fine, but at the end of the day, the obedience is what he's looking for. And not perfection. He's looking for obedience because he already knows what you're gonna do. So your calling is so important, not only to you, for you to see God in a different way, but your calling is important to everyone here, everyone in the kingdom, everyone in the world who says you played your part. Welcome for playing your part because because of you now I know Jesus more and I can now maybe step out of the boat. So good. I think I wanna end um, just by talking about, you know, a little bit of context in Matthew 14 where Jesus had just received the news about his cousin, John the Baptist, being beheaded. And obviously grieving, he withdrew to pray. But the stalkers found him. I don't know if any children go to the bathroom with you, but I know the feeling of not having a moment alone. Or the dog. The dog, or the dog always finds me. Sometimes as mamas, we just feel like we can't get a moment alone. And then they're gone and you wish you had people. They weren't gone. But... I wanna talk about withdrawing and not a retreat that you've lined up childcare and food, but like getting alone with the scriptures and Jesus and carving out that time like Jesus did to be alone. So he went straight from grieving and uh, people found him. He fed 5,000. He dismissed his disciples. He went alone, tried to get away. And even though I know if I get away, probably, the winds are gonna hit my family. It's coming. 
I need to be wise about that. Even if I have a girls' night one night, I know I'm going to come home to a torn-up house. It's just the cost of doing business, right? But if I'm going to get alone, I need a partner who can protect that time for me and make it a priority in our family. And I really want to pray for and help single moms too say, we see you trying to carve out that time, trying to be all the things to all your people, but yet stay grounded in the word. Let's talk a little bit about getting alone in the scriptures as we end today. Yeah, I will just say briefly that there are seasons. Um, My season now allows me to do just that, to listen to the word, to read the word, and it's awesome, it is awesome. But I tell you, it was also awesome when all I had was veggie tales. Like literally, I was so exhausted. All I had was something else. And so, like I said, wherever you are, God is speaking. Yes, read the Bible, 100%. I love it. I, I encourage it. But there were times when I'm like, Lord, you have got to speak through Larry because I'm so exhausted. <laughs> like he has got to give me a word, a message from the Lord. You know, he has got to do this right now. And it's crazy because I would get like talks from that. I'd get talks. Like I'd see myself talking to people in groups based on something that I was listening or watching. So my encouragement is, y'all, this is life. It is life. And it's not a checklist. It's not read and I check, I did it. Fine. You, you'll, get in, you'll get out of it what you put into it. So my encouragement is you sit or you listen, or you watch with your kids, um, and just say, Lord, I I just need you, because I don't know what it means, I don't understand it, it's too challenging, and I'm telling you, you're gonna read it, and you're gonna go, what? I'm like, that was not there last year, I promise. I'm I'm getting new eyes, going back to Judah. It's like the one, the two, the one. I'm like, no, I know, I know Peter walking on water, but no, it's like, no. Oh, wow, it's much more clear now. And that's what the living word does for us. It checks us in and makes sure we're not seeing blurry trunks. So that's, that's my biggest encouragement. You gotta do it, yes. Um, my mentor through Flourish, before it was Flourish, helped me hold that mirror up to my face. And just, I was busy with four little kids under the age of probably six or seven, but... I knew that the priority of the word was not first in my life. There's a little bit of survival going on, right? But I had to reprioritize everything. I had to leave laundry undone. I had to leave all the gunk from breakfast out. Don't wipe it down. Don't put away the dish. Don't do all the things that settle your mind so you can have time. Make this a priority. And if you're not a morning person, revelation from the Lord will fire you up more than any cup of coffee. And it is good and it is worth it. So will you just commission us today? Will you send us out today with a blessing and a prayer for all of those who have a mothering heart, whether they have a child under their care right now or they are in a different season, but they have that mothering heart to to spur us on in the Lord. Just send, just send us out today with a prayer um, for all of those people. Of course, let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, like you are so awesome. You are so awesome. And although I may not know every story, we don't know every story that's represented or that's listening, Lord, like you do. So I pray that um, you would touch each one of us in the way that we need to know that we are not alone, to know that we are seen, to know that we are valued, to know that you are sovereign and you knew us before our parents even did. So Lord, I pray that we just look to you through all things, Lord. I pray that we we get out of the boat or we stay in the boat or whatever we do, we're looking at you. So Lord, I call and I ask that this community, that the kingdom, that your kingdom be strengthened because the obedience of its people because it's desire and longing to know you more and to be more and more like you, not perfectly, but a heart's desire to know you like no other person on earth can. So I thank you for this day. I thank you for these hearts that represented both mothers and non-mothers, Lord. All of us crying out saying, 
I want to know something. And now I know that something is you. And you are the one, Lord, that can provide the things that I need and the way and the, um, the ability to know that I'm not alone. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this Mother's Day. We thank you for all of the emotions that it comes with, whether we're in good commun- a relationship with our moms or not. Lord, I just pray for all of it. I cannot name all of it, Lord, and I know, but I know you can. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you for this day and we thank you for all who are here wanting to know you more. Lord, help us to clear our vision and for it to be more clear today than it was even yesterday. And we ask these things in your name, amen.